into some Bible verses that um, evidence um, what we believe. So I'm just trying to get the, there we go. So let's get, let's have a look at some Bible verses. Um, the first one, uh, which is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, notice what it says. It says, um, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So we know that when Christ returns, he's going to be giving people a reward. In Revelation 12, 22, verse 12, we see this also affirmed it said, where Christ says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every, to give every man according as his work shall be. So uh, in this verse here, we get to see how, you know, when Christ is returning, he's going to have a reward with him. And what my question is, uh, does he determine his reward in his mind and just come and just comes to earth and just gives it? or is there a process which determines uh, what that reward shall be, uh, not just in his own mind, but in the eyes of uh, the heavenly hosts uh, prior to him giving us that reward? And I propose that uh, there most certainly is a, a process in which um, uh, what reward uh, people receive is determined. Uh, so let's have a look at uh, our our next Bible verses. Um, I propose that it is through the uh, investigative judgments uh, that takes place before the second advent of Christ um, that the reward that we will receive on that day, uh, I believe it's in that process that this is determined. And I think that Christ alludes to this investigative judgment uh, in Luke chapter 12, verses uh, 1 to 3, and I'll just read from verses 2 and 3. It says here, Christ says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon housetops. So what's Christ alluding to here? He's alluding, he's alluding to um, our lives being examined and looked at. It's not our life records aren't going to be covered. They're going to be made known, proclaimed from housetops, as Christ put it. And he also said in Mark chapter 4, verse 22, for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. Uh, the Apostle Paul also alludes to this uh, investigative judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, where he writes, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. So notice how Paul is uh, teaching here that prior to the time of people receiving um, their, their reward, there's going to be this, uh, this judgment of evaluation that takes place and this disclosing of things which uh, in human eyes were, were kept secret. Because we can't read uh, people's minds, but uh, in the investigative judgment, I propose that uh, those things that take place within people's minds will be shown uh, to the heavenly hosts. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, I believe we also have the investigative judgment alluded to. Uh, he writes here, the Apostle Paul, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body whether good or evil. So now I'm going to get into um, where do we see this investigative judgment um, shown in the Bible as like a scene. Um, and I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with that Daniel chapter 7 prophecy uh, that begins with uh, the lion representing Babylon and the mini of Persia represented by the bear, so forth, so forth. Um, and then in verses 9 to 10 of chapter 7, uh, in this timeline that we get from chapter 7, 
uh, we get to read these verses, which I'll, I'll read from the screen right now. It says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Notice in these verses, we get to see books being opened and a court sitting in judgment. And this verse, these verses here, I, I propose that they are alluding to this investigative judgment that takes place before the second advent of Christ, where books are open and life records of people are examined and evaluated. And one of these, and one of the purposes um, is to determine uh, what will their reward be, but that is by no means the sole purpose. Uh, there was more to it than that. And that's what we're going to get into right now. What is the purpose of this investigative judgment? And I'm going to, to, to clarify what this is, I'm going to start by mentioning what the purpose of the investigative judgment is not to help clarify what it is. So uh, the, it is not the purpose of the investigative judgment to investigate a person's life record to identify whether or not that person has transgressed God's moral law in order to cause that person to come under the law's condemnation. For it is not necessary for any investigative judgment to take place in order to cause a person to come under the law's condemnation. It is rather the purpose of the investigative judgment for the heavenly hosts to attain proof that God is perfectly loving, righteous, and just in permitting the ultimate fate of every single person entangled in the sin situation. That is what I propose is really at the crux of the whole investigative judgment, the character of God. This is all a part of the big great controversy concept. God needs to falsify every single one of Satan's accusations made against him. The character of God needs to be shown to the whole universe that it is perfectly loving and perfectly just and that the requirements of his moral law, which is the foundation of his government, is perfectly just and the investigative judgment uh, is a necessary component in order for God to prove this. Reading on. So when we read verses like Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 to 14, we don't need to worry. And I'll explain, uh, I'll elaborate on that after I read the verses. It says here, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So according to these verses, every single work of ours, whether it be good or whether it be evil, will be taken into consideration when our life records come up in the investigative judgment. But we need not to be afraid of this because it's not the purpose of the investigative judgment to cause us to fall under condemnation, because we don't need any investigative judgment in order to come under the law's condemnation. Uh, as soon as we sin without any investigative judgment, uh, we have sin imputed to us and we come under the law's condemnation and uh, deserving of the second death right there and then without any in ju investigative judgment taking place. Um, so, uh, the purpose of the investigative judgment is to prove that God is perfectly loving, righteous, and just in the ultimate, in, in what our ultimate fate uh, will be. Uh, so the fact that our good deeds and our bad deeds are going to be uh, looked into in the investigative judgment, this should not concern us. We have given our hearts to Jesus and we trust in him fully. He will be perfectly loving and just in saving us, even though our sins are examined by angels. So, uh, this verse is not at all, uh, should not at all be concerning to us. So I'll read on. So I propose that the purpose of the investigative judgment is to show to the universe what humans meet the conditions or prerequisites necessary for God to be perfectly loving, righteous, and just in completely saving them and allowing them to in inherit heaven, and what sinful creatures meet the conditions necessary for God to be perfectly loving, righteous, and just 
in causing those sinful creatures to suffer the second death and an allocated portion of torment in the lake of fire. And in order uh, for uh, this to be shown to the universe, it is very necessary that every single creature involved in the sin situation has their life record um, examined and evaluated. Um, and in the investigative judgment, we also get to see um, uh, ha one way that God gets his character vindicated in the judgment is by um, uh, the angels in heaven getting to see the gospel take place in our lives. Are we taking heed to the gospel? Are we allowing God to transform us? Um, I won't read through all these verses for the sake of time, but if you notice uh, in chapter, um, in verse 12 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, we get to see that the angels desire uh, to look into um, the gospel taking place in our lives, becoming manifested. When we see, when, when the angels um, see salvation taking place in our lives, um, they love to see that. They, they desire to, to see that. Um, and it's, it's when uh, the gospel takes place in our lives and the manifestation of it and we are, uh, and God is setting us free from sin more and more. Uh, God is producing the evidence in our lives, uh, which affirms the idea that He can be uh, perfectly righteous in saving us. Um, and just to support that, uh, at the crux of the judgment is God being judged um, as well as human beings, is Romans chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, which I have a quick read of right now. It says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So what I propose is taking place in the investigative judgment is that the angelic creatures are evaluating the judgments of God on our lives and in allowing our ultimate fate. And in order for um, God to, um, in order for the angels to evaluate the judgments of God, it is necessary that they evaluate and examine the, um, uh, the life cases of every single person involved in the sin situation. So uh, a, a component of this investigative judgment process is really God being audited. It's God um, showing to the whole universe all of his actions, all of his, all of his deeds, and letting the angels see for themselves that God was right in the great controversy situation between uh, him and Satan. That God truly is perfectly loving and just in every single one of his ways. It's to prove to the universe um, that without a doubt that all of Satan's uh, accusations were completely false. God has to leave no stone unturned. Every single one of Satan's accusations needs to be falsified. And this necessitates um, God being evaluated. And that includes um, the way God judges creatures. That itself needs to be um, examined and evaluated by angels itself. Uh, so the evaluations of God are being evaluated by angels, if that makes sense. Um, and we get to see this um, uh, being supported in the book of Job. And I, I won't read through all these verses. Um, but this is those verses in chapter 1 of Job where we get to see Satan coming to this heavenly meeting. And um, we, we get to see uh, Satan, Satan saying um, that he's been, you know, walking up and down across the earth. And God says to so Satan, um, have you considered my servant Job, that there was none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? So Satan alluding to how he's, you know, going uh, to and fro on the earth, he's alluding to, I own this place. Uh, I believe Satan was insinuating that all these people here, they're all mine. Your law is unjust. It's impossible to obey. They're all sinning. But then God points out to Job, who is keeping his law. And then Satan says, does, jo does, uh, does Job fear God for no reason, says Satan. And then he says also, have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? 
You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. So what's Satan insinuating here? He's insinuating that Job is uh, serving God out of selfishness, uh, which in of itself is really contrary to God's law. So really, uh, Satan is, is accusing Job of, uh, of Job falling short of the true um, spirit of God's law. Thus, he is indirectly making attack against God's law, um, making out as if it's unjust uh, in its requirements. And, and that's why you have God allowing Satan to uh, cause havoc in Job's life. Uh, just to show to the universe who was right in that situation. And ultimately, God was shown right. Job was keeping um, God's law. Job did not curse God to his face. Job was keeping the law of God for selfless reasons and not selfish reasons. And Satan was, uh, was shown wrong in that battle. But of course, the war is much more bigger than that battle. Uh, moving on, here are some verses that affirm the need for God's uh, righteousness to be revealed to the universe. We read in Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and they sang and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. What would be the point of these verses mentioning this uh, revealing of God's righteous acts and the righteousness and truth of his ways if there was no need for those things to be revealed? I propose that there most certainly is a need. Every single one of Satan's accusations needs to be falsified. Again, I'll just read verse 7 of chapter, um, of chapter 16. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The judgments of God need to be uh, justified and vindicated through those judgments of God being judged by angelic creatures. Um, now I'm going to get into the uh, heavenly records. In order for our life records to be evaluated and examined in the investigative judgment, it's, it's necessary that... Uh, records are created in heaven so that when the books are opened, it's got the details of our lives um, that the angels can think for themselves and see for themselves that the verdict that God gives on our life's case is perfectly righteous and perfectly loving. So let's give, so go through some Bible verses that um, allude to these heavenly records. So if we go to um, Luke chapter 20, verse, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Uh, we get to see how Christ mentions um, the names of his disciples being recorded in heaven. And uh, Paul himself in Philippians 4.3 talks about these fellow workers who, whose names are in the book of life. So our names are recorded in heaven, according to these verses. Uh, and we also have in the heavenly records, our good deeds are recorded. Those, work, those deeds which Christ works through us. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, I'll just have a read of that. It says here, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Notice Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? This book being the book of remembrance, the book of uh, the records that contain the, the good deeds. Uh, notice Nehemiah 13, 14. Remember, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Uh, there also exists records in heaven of our sins. Notice Psalm chapter 90, verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Jeremiah 2, verse 22. Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord God. Isaiah 65, verses 6 to 7. 
Behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. So according to these verses, what is it that is written before God? The iniquities. Okay, next question we're going to try to answer. What is the nature or the composition of the judgment of God process? I propose that it looks somewhat like this. In the judgment of God, in this uh, process of, of God being judged, uh, it, uh, and when every single person's uh, life case comes up, uh, this is what it looks like. First, there is an evaluation or an investigation of a person's, uh, of a person's life record when it comes up uh, in the judgment. And that's examined by God. It's examined by um, angelic creatures. After um, that life record um, of a particular person is examined, uh, then there is uh, the verdict aspect of the judgment. When the verdict is given, the decision is, is given in regards to that person's ultimate fate, whether it be for them to uh, inherit heaven and then have a, a heavenly reward, or whether that fate of theirs be um, uh, to suffer in torment in the lake of fire according to the sins accredited to them, uh, as well as the second death. Um, and then after that um, is been decided, then there is the execution of that verdict, the executive aspect of the judgment. Uh, and, and what I propose um, is that it's not going to happen all at once. From one, one person at a time, a case is going to come up in the judgment and the person has their life record examined and then there's a verdict given and then at a future point in time, after the verdict is given, generally at least, that is when the person will receive the, uh, the executive aspect um, of, their, of their judgment. Um, and that go, and this, you know, this process takes place for um, every single person uh, involved in the sin situation entangled in it. Um, so my, the next question I would like to answer is that um, uh, though the judgment um, that uh, the aspect of the judgment that involves the examination of uh, those that have their names written in the book of life and who are potential candidates for heaven and um, those other people that don't have their names written in the book of life, um, do they all get judged at the same time or um, are there two separate evaluations of judgment um, as like as in there's two different um, sets, for example, of, of what's described here. I'll give I'll share a Bible verse and I'll, I'll elaborate why, what I mean if I'm not clear enough. If I've, if what I've said is a little bit confusing, so we read uh, John chapter five verse twenty eight through to twenty nine. It says here, "Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life." and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So notice how this verse is alluding to two different resurrections. Could it be that like how there's two different resurrections, there's two different evaluations of judgment? I propose that that is the case. Uh, there are two separate evaluations of, of judgment. There's an evaluation of judgment that takes place uh, for the resurrection of life that, that precedes that. And then there's another evaluation of judgment that precedes the, this resurrection of judgment uh, being alluded to. And now I'm going to share a Bible verse that affirms this. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, uh, notice what it says. It says here, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. Now, what does it mean to measure? If we go to uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 2, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For what judgment ye judge, ye will be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it will be measured to you again. So this measuring has to do with judgment, doesn't it? Right? And notice how who's in verse 1, who's being described as being measured? It says the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. 
And I propose that this first group being alluded to, those that worship within the temple of God, are those that have their names written within the Lamb's book of life. Um, and notice verse 2. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So notice how those that are worshipped within the temple of God are being judged, mentioned as being judged at this time, but those who are without the temple of God are not. They're going, those other people outside the temple of God who don't have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, their judgment is going, and their, eval, their judgment of evaluation or evaluation of judgment, uh, that's going to take place at another point in time, is what I propose. And this is what I think uh, we get to see here in Revelation 11. Um, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 also supports this by mentioning that judgment begins at the house of God. Um, so the, the judgment of evaluation um, that uh, is for the resurrection of life that takes place first, takes place first before uh, the wicked uh, receive their uh, ultimate uh, damnation and, and suffering of, of what they deserve. So that's the sequence. Um, so just to summarize um, what I'm proposing, uh, the first judgment of evaluation, which we can call the, the pre-advent investigative judgment, shows to the universe what humans meet the conditions necessary for God to be perfectly loving, righteous, and just in completely saving them and allowing them to inherit heaven. And the second judgment of evaluation shows to the universe what creatures meet the conditions necessary for God to be perfectly loving, righteous, and just in causing those creatures to suffer the second death and an allocated portion of torment in the lake of fire. And I believe that um, this second judgment of evaluation uh, is mentioned by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. And I have a read of that now. It says here, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So according to Paul, we who are saved in heaven are going to be judging angels. Not the good angels, of course, but those angels having sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, now, in Revelation chapter 20, uh, I believe we get to see this um, scene of, the, um, uh, of this second judgment of evaluation uh, being mentioned. I'm not going to go through all these verses, but I'll just uh, uh, point out some points we can learn from these, and then I'll let you study Revelation 20 um, in your own time. In the first half of the chapter, we get to see it mentioned um, that uh, those who are people of God, authority to judge gets um, given unto them. And then um, in the second half of, of Revelation 20, um, we get to see that um, after, the, uh, after the sky flees away, which occurs at the second coming, uh, we get to see, um, it says here, the dead, uh, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. It talks about the dead being shown before the throne of God. And what I propose that is alluding to is those who are dead um, coming before the throne of God through their life records. Notice it says that they're dead. They're not alive. They're dead. Um, and because the dead are not conscious um, and they couldn't possibly uh, in person come before the throne of God. So it is through their life records that exist within heaven that they are coming before the throne of God. And these books are being opened and the dead are being judged by what is written in the books uh, according to what uh, they have had done. So this is, um, I propose, that second judgment of evaluation uh, being um, alluded to here. Um, and then after those verses, we get to see the resurrection of the dead being alluded to when it says death and Hades delivered up the dead. What's that referring to? It's referring to the resurrection of the dead. And then it talks about how they were judged according to their works. That's the execution 
of their judgment. And then after that, it mentions death and Hades, that's death and the grave, being cast into the lake of fire. And that's because after every single sinful creature of the universe has been destroyed by the lake of fire, um, there is no more death. There is no more grave. And in that, it is in that sense that uh, death and Hades, death and the grave are cast into the lake of fire. It's a bit of a, a tricky verse, but it, it does make sense. And according to verse 15 of chapter 20, everyone who has not, was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, and I'll just mention this here. Uh, the reason why people such as Judas Iscariot, who once had his name written in the book of life, will be cast into the, the lake of fire um, is because his name gets blotted out of the book of life. And once his name's not uh, blotted out of the book of life, uh, that necessarily means that he will go into the, the lake of fire. So my point with mentioning that is um, just because a person gets their names written in the Lamb's book of life, that does not um, guarantee their salvation because names can be blotted out according to verses such as Exodus 32, 32, I think it is. Um, and there's a few others, uh, even in the book of Revelation, it alludes to this um, as well. So now let's get into uh, what is the timing of the investigative judgment? When does the investigative judgment begin? Now, we as Adventists hold quite firmly uh, that the date that it began was the year 1844. And I propose that we can support this from the Bible. And I'm going to show you how we can uh, do that. But before I begin, I would like to address this verse, which is an apparent contradiction uh, with our understanding of the 1844 date. Uh, but when you go to the original Greek, uh, there's no issue at all. So notice this verse and notice if you um, let... Um, and just pick up if you notice any issues with the verse. It says here, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Notice the apostle Peter wrote this um, part of his epistle way before the year 1844, uh, back in his day when he was alive. And the way this verse words, it says that the, for the time is come in the present tense, that judgment must begin. So does that mean that the investigative judgment began in the days of Peter? Most certainly not. Uh, notice in this verse that the word is come is in, is in brackets or in your King James version uh, if you, of the paper Bible, it will be in italics. And I, I appreciate that the King James does that because it means that the word is a supplied word and it was not there in the original Greek. Uh, and a lot of other uh, English translations um, do uh, also translate it as if it's in the present tense or past tense or similar and, and give it a particular time, even though in the text in the original Greek, it doesn't specify the timing. So it's a bit of an error that exists in modern English uh, translations. Um, but fortunately, the King James does mention that it is a supplied word. Uh, so when you go in the original Greek, there's only one word in the whole verse that specifies timing. And it's the word that's translated here, obey not. Every other word in this text in the original Greek does not specify timing at all. Um, so I'll, I'll share with you what I think is a more accurate translation of this text. For the time of the judgment of the house of the God must have a beginning. And if it begins first with us, what will be the outcome of those disobeying the gospel of the God? So the only word in this text that specifies timing is the word disobeying, which is in the present tense. Every single other word does not specify past, present, or future tense. It's ambiguous in the way it's worded in the original Greek. So we can't use 1 Peter 4.17 to reveal the timing of the judgment because it's ambiguous. It, it just doesn't reveal it doesn't say if it's past, it doesn't say if it's present, nor does it say if it's future. It's ambiguous. So what should we do then in order to uh, understand the timing of the judgment? We need to go to other parts of the Bible, such as Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and just to show, bring up that timeline again, that chart, um, notice how in this chart we have the investigative judgment taking place after the little horn power uproots the three uh, other horns um, of the ten which had arose in monks. We see this in um, in verse eight. We mentioned we see mentioning here the um, the little horn uproots three um, three other horns by the roots, and then in verse nine, after verse eight, 
we get to see that investigative judgment scene being described. So according to the first half of Daniel 7, we can see, according to that timeline, um, that the investigative judgment must take place sometime after 538 AD when those, little horn, when those horns were uprooted. And then according to the second half of Daniel 7, it gets more specific. In verse 25, we get to, men, get, uh, we get to see mentioned here that time, times, and half a time that the saints will be given into his hand, right? That 1260 years. And after it mentions that 1260 years, which ends in 17, that ends in 1798, we get to see verse 26, which says, but the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed until the, to the end. So according to uh, the second half of Daniel 7, we can extract the information that it's after 1798, sometime after the year 1798, that the investigative judgment takes place. So Daniel 7 doesn't give us a particular year, but it does give us the information that it is after the year uh, 1798 that we can uh, know that sometime after the year 1798 that we know that the investigative judgment has its beginning. Uh, that is, of course, when you compare uh, Daniel 7 with history. Uh, there's another verse we can have a look at to uh, also help us understand the, the timing of um, uh, the investigative judgment. Uh, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to heaven, 6 to 7, we get to see this angel being mentioned with an everlasting gospel, with the everlasting gospel uh, to proclaim, right? And then this angel in verse 7 says, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Um, now, I know that the King James says the hour of his judgment is come which sounds like as if it's in the present tense, but really in the original Greek, the word has come, um, the hour of his judgment has come would be a better translation because in, in the original Greek, it's in the past tense. So according to Revelation 14, we can extract the information that during the time period of the everlasting gospel being proclaimed to the world, the hour of God's judgment has come. The fact that the everlasting gospel is still being proclaimed to the, those in the world um, necessarily means um, that probationary time has not come to its end because once probationary time comes to its end, there is no point in preaching the everlasting gospel because everyone is sealed. All their fates are sealed. So because of the fact that the everlasting gospel is being proclaimed during the time of this message being given, and this message includes the information that the hour of God's judgment has come, therefore the conclusion logically follows that um, the judgment of God process has its beginning before the close of probation. So according to Daniel 7 and Revelation 14, we can extract the information that the investigative judgment and the judgment of God process must have its beginning sometime after the year 1798, but sometime before the close of probation. We haven't yet proven the year yet, but we at least have established a, a time frame in which it begins. In order to pinpoint the date 1844, we must go to Daniel chapter 8. Um, and I'm sure uh, many of us are familiar with this prophecy. And I heard that um, you got to do a study on the sanctuary, which is uh, just last Sabbath, which is, which is wonderful, because um, hopefully it means I don't need to go over the information too much here. Um, and I'm sure, I, I hope that, um, yes, you know how we, we uh, come to the date 1844, uh, in regards to the 2300-day prophecy and how it ends uh, in the year 1844. Um, so just to bring up um, another timeline, notice the timeline uh, that, we, that we see in Daniel 8, So we, and, and also chapter 9, because it's two parts of the same prophecy, um, Daniel 8 and 9, um, because the vision of Daniel 8 was cut short and the rest of it given in, in chapter 9. Uh, it's a whole other story in of itself. Uh, but... We get to see here um, that Media Persia uh, exists, and then after Media Persia arises, arises Greece. According to Daniel 9, um, the time period allotted for the literal Jewish nation comes to its end in 34 AD. Um, and then after, after Greece arises in, in Daniel 8, we get to see the little horn being mentioned. And then after the little horn does its thing, we get to see this cleansing of the sanctuary being mentioned. 
right? So notice the timeline here. Uh, it's, it goes to the same timeline, um, except some details uh, are left out of Daniel 8 and some new details are mentioned in Daniel 8, but we can still see the same timeline. Uh, we still see Media Persia, Greece, Media Persia, Greece, and we also see the little horn. And we, in both chapters, we get to see the little horn described as, as doing its thing of persecuting God's people and, tra and trampling over them. We get, that, we get to see that described in, in both chapter 7 and chapter 8. Um, but notice the events that's mentioned after the little horn is described as doing its thing in, in Daniel chapter 7. It's the investigative judgment. And, and what is the next event described in Daniel chapter 8 after the little horn does its thing? It's the cleansing of the sanctuary. And notice how, how the symbols of the visions parallel. The, the he-goats, sorry, the ram parallels with the bear. The, the he-goat parallels with the four-headed leopard. The little horn here, you've got the little horn there in Daniel 8 and Daniel 7. And notice what parallels with the investigative judgment of Daniel chapter 7. It's the cleansing of the sanctuary. Could it be that the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment is two different ways of explaining the same event? I propose that it is, that both of those works are part of the same work, two different aspects of the same work, two different sides of the same coin. And um, this would necessarily mean that the investigative judgment process must take place in God's heavenly sanctuary where the cleansing of that, of that heavenly um, tabernacle uh, takes place. So can we support from the Bible that uh, God judges in his heavenly temple, in his heavenly tabernacle? I propose that we can. Let's have a look at Psalm chapter 11, verses 4 to 5. It says here, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. God judges in his heavenly tabernacle. Um, we, we also get to see that um, in, in the book of Exodus, uh, where we get to see the, the heavenly temple uh, typified and foreshadowed in the old covenant, um, we, get, we notice the details that inside the, the heavenly tabernacle, uh, interwoven into all the fabric, were cherubim, which are a kind of angelic creature, right? Uh, and we get to see that in Exodus 26, verse 31 and, and 36, 35, which mentions how cherubim were, were skillfully worked into the, into the linen, uh, which is the fabric of, of the internals of the tabernacle, right? And, and what I believe that this foreshadows um, is the angelic creatures that would exist within the heavenly tabernacle. And this would mean that when the, when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, um, where they would see all these cherubim, right, interwoven into the fabric, that would be a typification and a foreshadowing of what we get to see in Daniel chapter 7, when all these angels are with um, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, as he goes into um, the Holy of Holies. Um, we get to see um, the, the, all the angels being in the, present in the investigative judgment. We see that um, foreshadowed and represented and typified in the Old Covenant um, sanctuary system. And, and this brings me back to 1 Peter 1, which I mentioned earlier. Part of God being shown um, to be perfectly righteous in the investigative judgment process is um, for those people who he's going to decide as, uh, as being ultimately savable and allowable to take into heaven. The angels of heaven need to see the gospel of God taking place in their lives and becoming manifested in their lives. The angels desire to, to look into... Um, our lives and the gospel um, becoming manifested within it, as we see alluded to in, in verse 12. Um, the salvation of the prophets, um, uh, I'll read verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace of God that should come unto you, 
uh, verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now purported unto you by the by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. So what things is it that the angels desire to look into? It's the salvation taking place within our lives. It's the gospel becoming manifested within our lives. The angels love to see that. And when uh, we commit sin, um, the wicked evil angels um, go to, go to heaven or, or show to the angelic creatures uh, records of our sins saying, see these people here, they profess to keep your word, but then they're falling short of it. Um, therefore, you can't be perfectly righteous and just in, in saving them. But then what God does is by Jesus Christ entering within our hearts and enabling us to obey him and setting us free from the power of sin uh, and working in us and through us both the will of his good will and to do of his good pleasure, um, then records get created in heaven of our good deeds. Thus, the evidence uh, gets created that will show um, to, the, to the whole universe that God can be perfectly just and righteous in saving us. Because uh, although the devil, the demons can come to God and say, look at all these sins that they've committed. God can say, yeah, look at all these good deeds that they've committed that contradict the sins that they committed. Those sins that they used to commit, they're not committing them anymore. These records show that when those people were placed in the same situation that they were in the past, when they would commit sin, now when they're placed in that situation, by my grace, they are not committing those same sins that they committed in the past. They are overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. And, and it is in this sense, I believe, that we are to overcome Satan. It is by the blood of the Lamb that we are enabled to obey God. And it is by the word of his testimony that we falsify Satan's accusations that God cannot be perfectly uh, righteous and just in saving us. It's by God's grace and only through God's grace that we will be saved and that we will be able to um, perform good deeds because we cannot do that in of ourselves. In of ourselves, we are helpless without um, God. Our sinful flesh makes it impossible for us to obey God. But by Jesus Christ entering within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, he works a complete miracle. By us being connected to Jesus Christ, the true vine, we are able to bear fruit. And as Christ said in John 15, without us being connected to him, we cannot bear any good fruit whatsoever. Getting back, getting back on track. Um, uh, another way we can, we can uh, affirm the idea um, that um, the investigative judgment uh, process uh, be, uh, is a part of that same work of the, of the cleansing of the sanctuary work um, is what we can see uh, when we actually go to the um, original Hebrew of Daniel chapter 8. I know our King James Bible will say uh, 20, uh, 2,300 days in this shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But in the original Hebrew, um, that word translated cleansed is actually the same word translated in Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, as that thou mightest be justified. Um, and that's not an issue. And I, I actually want to use this opportunity um, to bring up this verse to also um, address um, an apparent uh, contradiction or an objection that some people can throw at our understanding, but it's actually a strength to our view. Um, uh, a more accurate translation of Daniel 14, I believe, if you stick more closely to the Hebrew, um, is uh, unto, unto uh, 2,300 uh, evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be justified. I just want to mention that the evenings and morning part the fact that in the original Hebrew, it doesn't say the word days, it says evenings and mornings. I just want to mention that's not an issue with our understanding because according to Genesis chapter one, what is an evening and morning? It's a day. So it still means 2,300 days in the end, 2,300 prophetic days. Uh, that is because it's in the context of a, of a uh, prophetic uh, revelation. Um, and then notice after this uh, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be justified. And 
The word justified in the original Hebrew, this particular word here, it can be quite a broad word in its meaning. And um, in the work of, of cleansing the sanctuary from its sins, the sanctuary is being cleared from its charges. It's being cleared uh, from those uh, from the imputation of sins that exists within it. And it is in that sense that it is being justified because when something is justified, it's cleared of the charges, right? So uh, 2,300 days in the sanctuary is being justified. It still works with our understanding anyway. So uh, I wanted to um, deal with that potential objection that people can throw with, at us, but also mention how this can be, the wording of the original Hebrew can be a strength uh, to our view. Uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So according to this verse, God's word is a double-edged sword, right? And, and we know how there's many prophecies that are dual in its application and that God's word can often um, have multiple applications and isn't just linear in its meaning. It's, it, sometimes it's not just singular in its meaning, but it can be a bit more deeper than it has a bit more deeper than that and have a multiple things uh, in regards to its meaning, right? And we know from verses like Ephesians chapter 2 and 1 uh, Timothy chapter 3, 15, um, that uh, the church, right, those that have their names written in the book of life, the church of God is also a temple of God, right? It's also the house of God, right? So with that being the case, what if we were to understand Daniel 8.14 as being dual in its meaning, in that it's not just referring to the temple in heaven as being justified, but it's also referring to that temple, which is those that have their names written in the book of life being justified, which would require an examination of their lives in order for them to be justified. If we understand this first like this, it would necessarily mean that 1844, October 22, would be the date in which this work of, of uh, justifying those that have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that Church of God, that Temple of God, um, would begin at that date, right? So uh, it's, I propose that this verse is not just alluding to the heavenly temple being justified, but it is on top of that, in addition to that, referring to um, the people of God who have their names written in the book of, Lamb's book of life as them also uh, having their names uh, evaluated in order for them to be justified. And, and just another verse to help um, act as the glue between um, these two things taking place as, as part of the one work um, is Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, which we read um, earlier on. Notice how the measuring of the temple of God, which is like the judging of the temple of God, the justification of the temple of God, and also that same measuring of them that worship within the temple, it's, it's described as like the one thing, as the one work, right? It's connected, right? And because of all these reasons, I think it is absolutely reasonable and biblical to connect the investigative judgment to the 1844 October 22 date. Um, and just to also further um, affirm that, uh, notice Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 2, uh, which follows verse 1, right? In verse 1, we get to see the investigative judgment being mentioned. In verse 2 of chapter 11, it says, and the court, and I'm reading from Young's literal translation because it accurate, uh, translates this a bit better than the King James. And the court that is without the sanctuary, leave out, and thou mayest not measure it, because it was given to the nations and the holy city they shall tread down 42 months, right? Because the, the King James doesn't use the past tense as the original Greek does, which Young's literal translation pulls out from the text. It was given to the nations and the holy city, they shall dread, tread down 42 months, right? So um, it was given. My point with that is this 42 months, which is at 1260 years, takes place before the measuring of the temple, right? So what Revelation 11 affirms is the same thing which Daniel 11 affirms, which is that, the, that, that investigative judgment takes place after the 42 months, right? So we, we, we have 
uh, more than just one witness here to affirm our understanding by by two or three witnesses is a matter established. We see that um, that that uh, idea repeated a few times in the Bible, and we do get to see the investigative just, uh, judgment affirmed uh, in the Bible from many levels, um, from multiple parts of the Bible. And um, just to uh, finish off here, because I uh, it's been I've been close to an hour, and I don't want to take too long. Um, I just want to allude to what is the standard of measurement in the investigative judgment. Um, and that is the, the moral law of God as what we see here in, in James chapter two, which is referred to as the royal law in, in verse eight. And in verse 12, just having a read here, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. So that is the moral law of God. Um, and that's not the only thing which we are, uh, are judged by. It's not the only measurement of standard of measurement in the judgment, but it is also the word of God, as we get to see in John chapter 12, verse 47 to 48. Christ said here, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words as the judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. It's the words of Christ. That, that judges us in addition to the moral law. But of course, a very important um, thing to be mindful is, of is, um, is that we are judged according to the light and the knowledge that we have. So James 4.17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That's different to the, the right thing which we have no absolutely no knowledge of what to do, if that makes sense. So where there is light and knowledge of the right thing to do, um, that's where condemnation can come. But where there is absolutely no knowledge and absolutely no light of what the right thing to do is, um, no condemnation can come upon that person for falling short of it because the light has not been revealed to condemn them. It's only when that light, that knowledge has been provided to that person sufficiently and um, but they choose to reject it, that's when uh, condemnation can come. So uh, to repeat myself, uh, if, if that wasn't clear, uh, where there is no light, there is no condemnation for, there is no light to condemn, but when light is given and that light is rejected, then comes condemnation. So notice Acts chapter 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance got overlooked or winks at, as the King James says, as in he's winking his eyes, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Um, so God is perfectly loving and, and also perfectly just in the way we co come under condemnation as well. He doesn't condemn us and he doesn't inf enforce a law that's going to condemn us uh, when we have absolutely no knowledge of its requirements. Everything that God's law requires of us is perfectly just. Um, God does not require the impossible. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we are never tempted above that which we are able, but God will always uh, provide a way to escape. So when God does provide us with the knowledge, but our flesh makes it impossible for us to live up to that knowledge we've been given, the grace of God will make it possible for us to live up to that life and knowledge. What we weren't for the grace of God, um, and the, and the, then God's law would be unjust in, con, in, in condemning us. But um, because we do have that grace available to us, um, therefore the conclusion logically follows that God's law is just in causing us to come under condemnation when it um, does condemn us. And um, I do have more I could present, but for the sake of time, I'll just uh, conclude with uh, answering this last question quite briefly. Uh, does investigative judgment mean that there are conditions or prerequisite, prerequisites upon it, um, inter, um, receiving everlasting life? And uh, I propose that it, it most certainly does, uh, quite obviously, and uh, the Apostle James alludes to this. So the question I'd like to answer, can we just believe in God's existence and believe that Christ died for us and believe that we accepted him as our saviour and just live our lives as we want uh, can God be perfectly loving, righteous, and just in saving us in that scenario? I propose that um, he can't. Uh, and, I, and now I'll, I'll proceed to read from uh, the verses. It says here, What good is it, my brothers, 
if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things in need, needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if that faith uh, does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So what uh, these verses um, are alluding to is that the mere belief in God's existence is, is not the kind of faith uh, that saves us. The faith that saves us is the faith that results in Jesus Christ entering into our hearts, which results in us doing the good works. So um, what the investigative judgment reveals to the heavenly creatures is whether or not our faith is genuine. Does our faith um, result in Jesus Christ entering into our hearts, resulting in our uh, good works? Because if it doesn't, friends, then uh, if if our faith, if we are choosing to cling on to sin, God most certainly uh, God most certainly cannot be perfectly just in saving us. Because if He were to allow any single one of us who were clinging on to sins into heaven, then Satan could say, "Hey, you allow him who's clinging on to sin to get into heaven. Why don't you let me and my angels come back into heaven too?" So, it is necessary that we take hold of God's strength, that we do uh, make peace with Him by allowing Jesus to enter into our hearts. Um, that uh, we may uh, bear good fruit and that we may uh, abstain from sinning, um, that the heavenly creatures can see this manifestation of the gospel taking place in our lives, um, that God may be uh, perfectly righteous in saving us. Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are going to be many uh, people who are only nominal Christians, people who are Christians only in their name and not in their lives, who are not having Jesus enter into their hearts, who think that they're saved, uh, but they're not. Their, their faith uh, is not the complete kind of faith. It's not a saving faith. A faith that is a saving faith is a faith that consists of not just our belief in, our, in, in God's existence, but it also consists of our choice to obey God. It also consists of our belief that obeying God um, is going to result in the most best and most perfectly loving uh, outcome. If we truly do trust that obeying God is going to result in the best outcome, then we're going to obey him and do it, aren't we? It's, it's, it's when we um, uh, acknowledge what God's commandments say and say, I'm going to do things my way. It's really a, a great testimony of lack of faith on our behalf because when we say, I'm going to disobey God, uh, it's a, it shows that that person trusts in the idea that their way is better than God's way. If we truly trust that God's way is better, then we're going to choose to uh, do things God's way. And th this is how <laughs> the investigative judgment shows the universe whether or not our faith is genuine. Where do we have our faith? Is it in God or is it in some, somewhere other than God? We need, as, as Christians, we need to be holding to a complete understanding of the definition of faith and not the limited definition of faith that uh, many Christians or people who profess Christianity in the world possess today. Romans 2.13 says, for it is not the hearers of the law that who are righteous before God, 
but the doers of the law who will be justified or shall be justified. The justification mentioned in this verse is not talking about the justification that is forgiveness of sins. This is a judgment. This is a justification that takes place in the future. Notice how it says the doers of the law who will be or who or the doers of the law who will be justified or shall be justified. That's in the future tense. And in the context of Roman, the first half of Romans 2, the Apostle Paul is talking about uh, judgment and that kind of thing. Uh, so that is uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 13 is another evidence for the uh, investigative judgment to take place in the future. Anyway, I, I think um, I'll conclude uh, my study here, but I'll just like to uh, mention to everyone um, how much we need Jesus Christ. We need to be taking hold of his strength. We need to be allowing God to work in us, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. We need to be allowing God to transform our hearts right here in this lifetime. When we are on our journey of sanctification, heart transformation, um, we need to be saying, yes, God, transform my heart, mold me and fashion me, make me like Jesus in character, make me willing where there exists a sinful emotional unwillingness, make my heart, take it, make it wholly yours. We need to be allowing God to do this. We need to, if we are clinging on to sin and saying, oh, I love sin, I'm unwilling to depart from it. God cannot be perfectly just in saving us. He can only uh, remove from our hearts that which is sinful that exists within it. Uh, if he can be perfectly righteous and just and loving in doing that. God is a respecter of freedom of will and the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of heaven's government. He's not going to take away sin from our lives if we are unwilling for him to. And I would like, and in regards to assurance of salvation, the investigative judgment by no means contradicts assurance of salvation. If we have Jesus Christ in our heart uh, and have chosen to give ourselves fully to him and we fully choose to obey him, and live up to the light that um, he's given us. He will bring to completion that good work he's begun within us, uh, whether that work is brought to completion after we've died, but before our resurrection or in this lifetime. There were people such as the thief on the cross that weren't given the opportunity to get the complete victory over sin in their lifetime and didn't um, completely receive um, the writing of God's moral law in their heart and the removal of the law of sin written in their heart from their heart. That's a gradual process that takes time. And there were some people that uh, didn't get that work completed in their lifetime, but they were on the journey. They're on that journey of overcoming. And God will um, bring to completion their good work um, after, their, after they have died, so that when they are resurrected, they will be resurrected with a sinless heart and a sinless character, because there's not going to be one person taken to heaven who has any law of sin written within their heart. All sinfulness must be removed from us in order for us to inherit heaven and in order for us to have our life record vindicated in the investigative judgment. God needs to prove to heaven that um, we are safe to take to heaven in order for him to, um, to take to heaven. But those people who are given the opportunity uh, to get the complete victory over sin in this lifetime and are given ample opportunity to allow God to write his law in um, their hearts and allow God to remove sin from their lives. Those people who are given ample opportunity uh, do need to um, uh, have that uh, complete aspect, that, that aspect of the gospel completed in their lives uh, before, they, before they die. Because if they were to ever say, no, I, 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 don't, I want to live sinning in, in my life right now, but in, in heaven, that's when God can, can set me free. No, that God's not going to do it. If, the, if we want to be saints in heaven, we must first be a saint here on earth. If we, say, if we are saying no to God now, why would we say yes to him in heaven? So please, friends, please say yes to God and give your heart fully to him. Allow him to make you into the creature that you want him to be and have assurance that he will bring to completion that good work that he has begun within you uh, to completion because he promises to do that. And I would like to invite you with, um, to join me in, in a word of prayer uh, to conclude uh, this, this uh, study. Father in heaven, 
thank you for our good and gracious and kind and loving you have been to every single one of us in this opportunity we've had to discuss spiritual things and study your holy word father i pray that you bring to completion every single uh, I, I pray that you bring to completion the work of sanctification you have begun within us father i pray my lord that you uh that you cause the gospel to become manifested within our lives father i pray that you help us to glorify your name help us to give uh jesus christ all the glory in our lives help us to desire the glorification of his name help us to put you first in every single one of our ways my lord and please make us into the creatures you would like for us to be and help us to uh provide to the world a a full revelation of jesus christ's character that we may vindicate you to the whole world that you that you may be sanctified in the eyes of the heathen as mentioned in ezekiel chapter 36 verse 22 in accordance with you all may hear and answer all these prayers in the question please may your name be glorified in doing that in the name of jesus christ we pray amen thank you liam there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> yes yes there, there so, was uh, quite a lot of info i really need to probably go over it again and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know a bit more understanding um anyway i i do have i have muted everybody and uh because of conflict of interest and the manner in which it's expressed i do have to mute everyone and um and if anybody wants to ask a question they can i will unmute them one by one and i do have uh, craig who has a question and i'll unmute craig for yes. this question yes i will um if you don't mind i just need to make an announcement before that for next week people um as you know next week is elders places um remnant have national meeting so we won't be having sabbath school as usual for those who are at sabbath school we'll be doing um, God willing, um, lessons nine and ten in two weeks' time. Um, so next week, uh, there's three meetings at 10, 11.30 and 2.30. And the theme for Elvis's address is, um, well, I wrote it down here. Oh, yes. How, how do we relate to times like these? So there are three different messages um, next week with Elvis Placer. Are you going to continue the recording, um, Supi, at the moment? Or you want to do with the questions? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, I'm recording. Yeah, okay. Um, well, Liam, what I said was you mentioned um, John 5, 28 and 29 from the ESV. Now, I want you to comment on John 5, 27 to 29. Um, in the King James Version, in verse 27, the word judgment is used. And in verse 29, the word resurrection is used. Whereas you, in your quote you gave, in verse 29, the ESV uses the word um judgment instead of resurrection now this in the uh, original greek in verse 27 um is a different word from the verse from the word in verse 29 so why does the esv use judgment when resurrection is really what's meant as far as i understand it right so i do have the, the king james uh right here um with uh verse 29 of, of john chapter 5 um so in verse 29 of John chapter 5, I'll just read um, this verse here in the King James. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Um, so uh, the difference that I see between um, uh, the King James and the ESV with verse 29, instead of the word um, damnation, um, the word is judgment in the ESV, but the word oh, in King James is damnation. Is that is that the word that you're? Oh, I see. oh well, I mean, maybe I've got it wrong. I just in the King James version, verse twenty-seven says, um, "So hath he given that is the Father given the Son to have." Oh no, no, it's twenty-seven, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Oh, so so you saying in the ESV? The word judgment is used in what in place of what words in the King James Version? Did I get it that incorrect? Did I? Um, I, so I, read, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't read verse twenty-seven. I, I quoted. No, you um, didn't. 
but my point is related. What does the ESV say in verse 29 so that I can compare it, please? So I, I think the difference between the, the, the King James wording and the ESV wording is instead of the word damnation the King James Version uses, uh, the ESV uses the word judgment. Yeah, can you read that? Can you read it for me so I can, so I can compare it now? I, I might have got my point wrong. I just want to ask you to read in the ESV verse 29 so that I can compare it what I'm reading in front of me. Please. So you would like, okay, I'll, I'll just grab the ESV. Um, oh, okay. I've got an ESV over here. 